Welcome to Montgomery Talks, the podcast from Montgomery Community Media about issues with the county. I'm MCM senior reporter Doug Tolman, and we're recording this in our podcast studio in MCM's mothership in Rockville. With me today is Susan Callahan. Ms. Callahan is the chef instructor at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. She teaches a commercial food production class, including pastry, breads, beer, wine, and spirits. And while she teaches at UMES, she actually teaches at the universities at Shady Grove, correct? Correct. She's an award-winning culinary professional, winner of the 2014 Hometown Hero Award and the University of Shady Grove Sustainability Award. Welcome, Ms. Callahan. Thank you. So what are some of the most surprising locally produced products that Montgomery County has? The first thing that popped into my head is salad dressing. <laughs> wow. We have an awesome uh, salad dressing maker here, Dress It Up Dressing, and she's Sophia Maroon. It's delicious. It's sold in most farm markets. I've had the pleasure of knowing the product for about four years now and getting to watch the producer go from selling at the farmer's markets to finding it in local small markets, and I just found out that she's now in Giant in 100 stores. And it's really delicious salad dressing. That's the first thing that I thought of. Okay, and it's made here, and is it bottled here? It's not bottled. Unfortunately, it's not bottled here, but it was, in, you know, it was invented here. The owner is from here. The corporate office is here. She has to outsource the bottling. Okay, and the name of the dressing is what? Dress it up dressing. And it comes in a variety of flavors, oh, like yeah. you'd expect. Absolutely. The bla- my favorite is the blackberry, but she also has a red wine vinaigrette. She has a Caesar. She has a sesame tahini. I don't know all of them, but they're really oh, apple cider vinegar. It's really good. Oh, I'll have to look for that. That sounds good. So what else? I mean, can you find milk, cheese from there's Montgomery some, County? There's some cheeses I buy. It. Uh, oh, gosh. Firefly Farms. I actually brought the resource book with me if I have to do some research. Um, there's some great goat cheese. I don't think there's anybody making cheeses. Cheese is really complicated, and it's there's a lot of laws that go into it. It has to be in, in a sterile environment because of the bacteria. So cheeses are harder, but soft cheeses are more available. Okay. And I'm a big fan of goat cheese a lot. Me too. And of course, people have been talking a lot about beer in Montgomery County, particularly craft beer in Montgomery County. How important is beer to Montgomery County as far as a, a as far as a food that's been created here? Well, beer is actually growing faster as, than wine was. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's moving faster. It's getting more recognition. More women are drinking beer than you know. Beer used to be thought of as a guys' thing, but there. I in teaching it, I used to teach the students, "I'm going to find a beer that you like, even if it's some ridiculously sweet beer that most people wouldn't like, I like a Belgium ale that has raspberries or peach in it." But there's a lot of great beer, and Denison's is coming up with some wonderful beer. As is Wardeca. Wardeca has really got some great beer, and it's a great environment to be in. And um, you're in Beer Central, this neighborhood, because there's True Respite is just down the road, oh. and Saints Row is around the corner from them. So, Well, I have to do a tour then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody wanted to buy these local products, you mentioned the farmer's markets and the, the, the dressing is in the giant. I mean, is there a place to go to find these products? I think um, Dawson's is probably your best bet. It's just recently changed owners, and um, they really have a commitment to local product. They have a commitment to good product and, and really sourcing carefully crafted and curated products. So, you know, that would, Mom's Organic is also smaller, local, not Montgomery County centered, but Mom's Organic is another one. There are some small markets. I think there's one in um, Friendship Heights, but the smaller markets, but I happen to like Dawson's. And it's central to the county. It's right there in downtown Mm -hmm. Rockville. Is there any milk being produced in Montgomery County? It's, there's, we've got the huge uh, ag reserve. Yes. You think that there would be somebody who's doing dairy. And... Yes, there is somebody doing dairy, and, and I, it's just fo- totally escaping me right this okay. moment. But there is somebody on the eastern side of the county, and they actually have a high-tech milking system where the cows come in and they have – I think I could be really wrong on this, but I think it's a chip. So the cows come in, and they're, they get to eat and get milked all at the same time. And it's, <laughs> recorded, it's recorded that they – when they're coming in, so yes, creamery, something with a wood, wood-born creamery. I could be really wrong on that. Okay, all right. um, but they make and they make good ice cream too. Oh my, okay. I, I've spent some time on a dairy farm, and they are fascinating operations. Yes, they are. And cows are very particular about where they get milked. Mm-hmm. Um, they they have the slot that they want, mm-hmm. and they get upset when somebody takes it. And you never think a cow would do that. But. And they're cool. They're sweet. <laughs> they're big. So uh, these foods are, um, in many cases, sustainable, mm-hmm. or, or in all cases, sustainable. Talk about that. Well, so my focus is on the economics of buying local because I teach the sustainability course. And the idea is if you're buying locally, I mean, it's it's probably cheaper to buy 
a national brand that comes from Minnesota or something. But if you're buying locally, the money stays within your county. So you're, that farmer or producer is employing people. Um, they're keeping the money. They're paying taxes here. And so the, the food that we buy that's local is just staying within the county. So economically, it makes sense. It also makes sense that you're buying food that has traveled a little shorter in its footprint or, or carbon footprint. So you're buying food that, you know, comes within 15, 20, 30, 50 miles of you. So that's sustainable. I live in Silver Spring. And again, working with my college students, sometimes they've never been to a farm. They don't really know where the food comes from. And I think it really behooves all of us going forward to kind of know where our food comes from. And I think it's really important to buy locally and get to know the farmers. And take. I take my grandchildren, I took my kids out into the fields to see the farms and to, to see a cow and to see a goat and learn about how cheese is made. You know, I think it's important that we know that. We ingest that. And how exactly does buy, you, you said the taxes stay in the county, but these are also jobs in the county. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Even if it's a farmhand, it's still a job. It's a job for a, a young person, maybe their first job working on a farm or somebody working in a farmer's market. It's really, farmer's markets are, again, almost look kind of like our town center now because people go there and hang out and there's music and food. And what a great opportunity for a young person to work in a, a farmer's market and do customer service and meet people and be outgoing. It's great. Has anybody done done any sort of research and and how important uh, these farmers markets are to the economy? I bet there, I'm, I'm sure there have been. I'm just not familiar with it. Because I'm sure, well, at least thousands of dollars are probably oh, changing absolutely. hands every weekend mm-hmm. when there's a, far, at a farmer's market. And so how can consumers connect more fully to these sustainable products and these sustainable food sources? Where can they find out about them? Where can they, where can they you know, interact more with the, uh, the, the producers? Well, the Food Council has a, a book that's available in most markets, not most markets, but smaller markets. I know it's in Dawson's. So the Food Council produces a booklet every year that has local food and and, or you can go to the Food Council website, which is it's a public-private partnership, MontgomeryCountyFoodCouncil.org. And you can go and find the local producers. Just going to a farmer's market on a Saturday or a Sunday morning and spending a little time there and kind of getting to know the farmer. I know the farmer wants to get to know you and know what you want. It's fun. It's social. It's delicious. <laughs> Uh, a CSA is another way. You know, it's finding a farmer and buying a CSA. And there are CSAs available all in so many different fashions now. You can buy it once a month. You can buy a meat CSA, a cheese CSA, a vegetable CSA. It's pretty cool. And a CSA is, for people who don't know? Uh, con- Consumer-supported agriculture. So that you buy a share in a market or you buy a share with a farmer and then you get pretty much what you decide upon. I buy a meat share from a, a farmer and I get once a month delivery and I get, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 pounds of meat. We're carnivores in my house. So uh, yeah, it's that. So that's what I buy. But I also, I love the process of going and seeing what's fresh and local and getting outside and walking and seeing my, seeing my neighbors. It's kind of old fashioned. Old fashioned, but it's somehow coming new again. Absolutely. Yeah. So you also teach. I do. How do you use locally produced products in your classes? Well, I about five or six years ago, I just decided that that's what I was going to do. I was buying the food for myself, and I just thought that in my little tiny platform of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore at Shady Grove, that when we did events, and we do about seven or to nine of them a year, that we were going to use, I was going to source as locally as possible. I was going to buy everything, at least 30%, I was going to buy from Maryland. So I buy butter from Frederick. I buy, I have a source for the beef that I want, the beef and the lamb. I buy Chesapeake blue catfish and I serve it at every event because I think it's important that people realize how tasty it is but also that it's an invasive species in our in the bay. I buy vegetables. I have a farmer who if I want something he literally grows it for me. Uh, if that's a small herb or something he'll grow it for me or I'll call him up and say okay I'm doing this event on this day. What do you think you'll have available and how can I get it? So it's been relationship building. The school appreciates it. I encourage everybody to again to support the local farmers. The Department of Agriculture culture for the county once did farmer cards. They were about 50 little kind of like baseball cards. So I would put them on every place setting. So get to know your farmer. And I, I just want people to realize that in our busy world, there are farms in Montgomery County and we should buy from them. Any idea of the number of farms? You don't think of Montgomery County as a, as a farming community. Well, the Ag Reserve is how many acres? 190? 90? Something like Something that. Something like that. I don't know. It's a lot of huge. acres. It's a huge swath. And there are farms there. Yes, there's green, there's grass farms, and there's equine farms. But there are tabletop farms. Lewis Orchards in Poolsville is one of the biggest tabletop mm-hmm. farms. And they've been around, are they third generation, second mm-hmm. generation? Delic- butlers. Mm-hmm. Even though we think of butlers more for agritainment, they make, they make delicious products. Their pie? Mm. 
I'm a big fan of pie too. So, <laughs> so um, you have students from all over the world. I do. Yeah. What makes them want to come to come to you? To and what are you teaching them? Well, 30% of the people in Montgomery County were born in another country. And then we have so many other people who, who are living in Montgomery County and their children who are either working in the District of Columbia or have just come here to live. And so we have a lot of international students. I get students from all over the world, South America, Central America, China. Right now I have a student from Burma. I've had a student from Tunisia. We have African students, Ethiopia, Kenya. And it's such a pleasure to work with these students because where, where does someone get that chance from? China or Burma to meet somebody from Ethiopia and work together on a common goal. And so it's really a pleasure. 99% of our students are full-time employed. So the University of Shady Grove are such a unique model that they get to finish their degree and still be employed. I don't know about other programs, but our students are all working in hotels and restaurants and they're getting their education. Their employers like it. Their employers come to recruit. So it's a, a, great, an op- it's a great opportunity for young people. Okay. I think now's a good time to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. This has been Montgomery Talk. I'm Doug Tallman, senior reporter at MCM, and I'm speaking with Chef Susan Callahan. We'll be right back. MCM, your community media center, is making Montgomery County a great place to live through programs like 21 This Week. Montgomery County's hardest-hitting political talk show keeps you up to date with the local political scene. Montgomery Community Media. Our middle name is Community. And we're back with Montgomery Talks. I'm Doug Tolman, senior reporter at Montgomery Community Media, and I'm with Chef Susan Callahan, who teaches at the universities at Shady Grove, as well as been a former member of the Food Council or a current member of the alumni. alumni. An alumni. Alum, that's what they call us, alumni. <laughs> alumni of the Food Council, which is what I wanted to ask you about because it, this is an interesting organization from mm-hmm. what I've been able to find out. Talk to me about you know what, why it exists and what it does and and and, and what their mission is. Well, the I've been involved with it almost from the beginning. They have subgroups that work on the impact of people's lives. So I was the chairperson of the Food Economy Working Group, which is really about the food businesses in the county and the jobs that food brings to the county. But there's also a food literacy. It's like, how do we learn about food? In my experience, people don't cook anymore. They don't know how to cook anymore. So how do we get people to understand how to cook (laughs) or what food, how food is grown or, you know, and where food comes from. So if the food literacy. There's also food recovery and access. So how do people who are in need get the food that they need? Um, There are 150 not-for-profit organizations in the county who are bringing food to those in need. So there's a working group for for that and environmental impact. So there's four working groups and they work independently on issues about the public and then they work together annually to set goals for what's needed. It came out of um, the county executive's office, I would think, six or eight years ago. It's a group of dedicated professionals and citizens who just care about the food systems that we partake in every day. Mm-hmm. So you're part of the food economy group. Mm -hmm. So, and this is all about people finding jobs, people working in the food industry, which includes not only just serving people, but providing those servers with food. Well, I mean, for instance, if you wanted to start your own bakery, how do I start a bakery? You know, it's kind of, or whatever it is. And how do I get my food to market? How do I get into the food system? I have the best empanada. I have the best barbecue sauce. How do I get it? So we, we work, we work with the county offices of legislation. If there's a small business now. So we bring her in and do seminars and workshops about that. I was lucky enough about four years ago to do a Chef and the Farmer uh, seminar at USG where I brought in farmers and producers in the county and I wrangled as many chef friends as I could find and we did like the speed dating. So chefs want local foods. Chefs and restaurants want to buy local foods. So, you know, making that connection. And what was the upshot from that speed dating between the farmer and the chef? I mean, did it re- did it result in you know more local produce going into absolutely it did going into restaurants? I have, a, I have the farmer that I buy most from is uh, Mark Mills with chocolates and tomatoes, and he was he's a very small farmer, very small organic, and I don't think he has more than ten acres. But he was able to make connections with Clyde's. He was able to make connections with Silver Diner, and maybe it's not a big scale that he's going to be able to send his food to, but he's be able to do something. You know, maybe one 
one product several times a year. It was great. It was it was lots of fun, and and I think the chefs really appreciated it too. Oh, good. Another working group that, that fascinates me, I hope you can talk about it, is um, the food recovery group. Because this is far different than what people usually think about in terms of providing food to the needy, where you know you go to the grocery store, you buy a box of something, you buy a can of something, you show up, you drop it off at your church, you drop it off at a, at a collection box, and it ends up in somebody's pantry. This kind of takes a entirely different avenue in towards doing that, correct? Well, it does. And in fact, there's, you know, we do food drives all the time. Uh, my church does it. Every, you know, local community centers do it. But it's changed a lot because now with our diverse econ- with our diverse community, um, like MANA is actually looking to do culturally, culturally sensitive food and teaching. So they're trying, they've they got a grant a couple of years ago to grow some particular vegetables that end up in the food bank so that when someone comes who's from another country, they don't see something they're not familiar with. So there's a whole movement to try and not only provide food, but good food, fresh food, fresh vegetables and fruits. You know, if, there's a really wonderful movie called Wasted. Um, if you get the chance, you should watch it. And there's food for people, there's food for animals, there's food for compost. So it's how do we use the food instead of throwing it away, which unfortunately happens all too often in big businesses and around our county. It's the food that just goes into the dumpster. So maybe it's not something viable that we want to give someone to eat, but maybe it's fit for animals consumption, or should we be composting it? So that's taking environmental impact and food rescue and putting it together, and how do we best serve the public? There's a lot of need in our county, and I I don't really want to quote real hard numbers, but I think it's one in three children get free or reduced lunch. So that means that there's a real need for children to get, and their families and their parents, to get healthy food. So, you know, there's backpack programs, there's the, the food banks where children, families can come in and pick up a box of good groceries that they can use for the week. So 150, 100, I just heard this last week and it blew me away, 150 organizations doing food for those in need. And that's kind of surprising in our very wealthy Montgomery County. Hmm. You mentioned Mana, who is not too far from mm-hmm. us, our, where, we, where we're speaking. Another charity that's not too far from us is Nourish Now. He got is... started in my kitchen. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, he did. I met him at the food council and I, and I, just said, you can store stuff in my refrigerator for a while. And he was there for about nine months. Okay. And that's Brett Myers. Yeah. And unlike Mana, he is complete. well, I won't say completely because I've been there and I have seen a few box things, but he is focused on getting recovering food mm-hmm. from caterers and mm-hmm. restaurants, food that's been prepared, but never, but right. still human, can still be consumed yes. by people mm-hmm. and then get it to the people who can And there, there's, um, I, I, again, I'm, cl- I'm friends with Brett. There are caterers that actually make food for him once a week and just set it aside and say, here, and he comes and picks it up once a week. I, the Mama Lucia actually makes food for him once a week and, you know, containers of pasta and he comes and picks it up because the businesses care about that. But yeah, I actually, a long time ago, worked in a re- food recovery business and there's leftover food all the time. I mean, f- when we do a events at USG. You know, if I do a breakfast for 300, which I do every year, I really have to make breakfast for 350 people. I do because you can't run out of food. So I ended up with these 50 extra meals. And after I fed the students, maybe I have 25 and that food goes to Nourish Now. It's really important that we don't throw that food away and realize that, you know, it's worth saving and rescuing and giving to somebody in need. So since you're on the other side, mm-hmm. can, uh, and when I say the other side, you're actually part of the, you produce the food for somebody. Is there a good percentage that people can know that, you know, if you're producing 100 meals, you just said, you know, 300, you meant 350. Is there a good percentage people can know that that amount of food is, would either have been wasted if it's not recovered? Well, you know, in catering, there's different caterers work on different percentages. If they're catering a lunch for 100 people, they may do 10% overage because they think that, you know, 10% more people will show up. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if you do an event for 100 people, that it might have a big rainstorm or snow and 30% of people don't show up. So that's why these food recovery businesses are so important because they take that food and they find a purpose for it. A caterer can't resell a sandwich. You know, they've packaged it. 
they've got it ready. They really can't resell that. They shouldn't resell that sandwich. They've made it for a specific party for a specific date. And so I know that Shady, um, that Smoky Glen is wonderful at that and that they sell tens of thousands of parties in the summertime. And every Monday they donate what's left over and they work with their they, their clients saying any food that's left over from the party, we give it, we give it to a food rescue agency. So there are really good businesses who understand how important it is to to share. <laughs> but also, you know, if there's anything left over, then we're going to give it to somebody who needs it. And most people are okay with that. Oh, okay. Is there anything that you've come across that can, that you can rank Montgomery County in terms of nutritional health? Is there is there any way to say, you know, we're actually healthier or maybe we're not as healthy or where we need to work on? on... I'm a cook. <laughs> So, so I don't, I don't really know. I, I don't really know about that. Okay. I know that I like butter and dairy and cheese and meat and fresh foods. I think the availability of fresh vegetables and f- local foods are really prominent in our community. I don't think anybody. I don't think there's a food. De- I know there's not a food desert in Montgomery County. So if that's a direct reflection on our health, yes. Do we need to do a better job of teaching people how to eat better? I think we do. And so I, I, I did a, a workshop for. A, university women a year ago, and they wanted me to teach them how to prepare meals quickly for work nights. And I said what I always say, which is cook on Sunday and, you know, remake it. But what I said was learn how to cook. So I think people should learn how to cook. I mean, I don't know how many meals are eaten out of the house every every week. You know, do we eat breakfast out? Do we eat lunch out? Besides being a cost, I mean, learn how to cook. Learn how to cook the chicken on Sunday so that you can make chicken salad sandwiches during the week. Or learn how to cook and you'll you'll eat better food. That's all I can say. Is you know, butter is not my enemy. <laughs> it's it, you know, I, there's great food available if you know how to use it, and it's not hard. It's, I, I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm a cook. I burn food. <laughs> I'm sorry, you burn food? I burn food. That's what I tell students. Baking is a science. I teach baking. Cooking is burning. (laughs) (laughs) To a certain degree, it really is. Is there anything, based on the the menus you create, though, is there anything that Montgomery County seems to be too fascinated with? Is there there too much pasta? Is there too much uh, fatty food? Is there not enough vegetables? Is there not enough fruit? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, I love grocery stores. I go to grocery stores all the time. I'm always fascinated by grocery stores stores when I travel. What fascinates me is, you know, all of the meal replacements that we buy. So there's a whole aisle in the grocery stores for power bars or protein bars or whatever they are. That's not food. I mean, it is food. It's calories. It puts calories in the body. It gives you fuel, but it's not food. So I, I want to wrap this up with a question I've always wanted to ask a chef. Ooh. You've just come home from a hard day's work. You've got to feed your family. What is, what, what is that meal? What is that go-to meal that you say, okay, fine, I, I'm, not trying to be, I'm not trying to be a celebrity chef tonight. All I want to do is put, is put food on the table and get people nourished and so, you can walk away happy. I tell people all the time that feeding your family is the hardest job in the whole world. And I cook for a living. So it is the hardest job in the world. So the uh, idea, and I say this, is cook on Sunday or Saturday or one day of the week and make two or three things that you like that you can come home and put on the table. So in my house on Sunday, Sunday, we roast chicken because my husband likes chicken. And so we roast two chickens and that gives us two, at least two meals, sometimes three. Um, I will buy a whole side of salmon or uh, and roast the whole thing. And so we eat roasted salmon one night and then I make salmon cakes. So they're pretty simple. Meatloaf, you know, you can make meatloaf with turkey if you like it. I put a little turkey in my meatloaf and then you can slice it and grill it the next day or eat it cold. But it's the, the simpler, the better. And give yourself a break and go out to eat every night. <laughs> than in a great local restaurant. It is hard. Feeding your family is the hardest thing. I don't have kids at home anymore, but, you know, trying to... Oh, this I once had... F- four boys, if you don't mind me indulging. One was a vegan. One was a weightlifter. One ate jello. You know, cooking for all of those people is hard. It's hard. It's the hardest job you have. All right. Well, I think on that note, uh, I think we should wrap it up. My name is Doug Tolman. I'm the senior reporter at uh, Montgomery Community Media. I've been talking with Chef Susan Callahan about food in Montgomery County on Montgomery Talks, the podcast at MCM where we talk about Montgomery County issues. Our engineer today has been Mike Valentine. Our executive producer is Gaynell Evans. Come back next time when we'll be talking Montgomery on Montgomery Talks. Montgomery Talks.